please welcome New York Times healthcare correspondent, Margot sanger Cat. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. We're taking on a really small, easy to solve problem. So I'm very confident that by the end of the hour, we're gonna have all of the answers. Um, I just wanna give you all a quick run of show and then I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our guests and uh, get things started. Um, each of our panelists is gonna speak for a few minutes uh, about some uh, ideas that they have about uh, how we can fix what is broken in healthcare. Then we're gonna have a discussion where I get to ask the questions and then we're gonna turn to a part of the conversation where you guys can ask the questions and I know that some of you have already submitted questions in advance, but I want to encourage you if you have a question that you have brought with you, or if uh, something one of our panelists says uh, brings you to a new question, you can submit one during the course of this conversation if you just click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So uh, our topic is uh, how to fix healthcare. And so I just wanted to uh, say a couple of things about some possible things that are broken about our healthcare system, although I suspect that our panelists uh, may elaborate more. But the United States, I think, in many ways has a really terrific healthcare system. We have wonderful doctors and uh, great scientific development and really great technology, but we also have some pretty serious problems. Uh, for one, uh, our healthcare system is incredibly expensive. It represents a large and growing share of our GDP. Uh, it ends up being unaffordable for a lot of people, which brings us to problem two, which is we have a lot of inequity in our healthcare system in access to healthcare and in the quality of healthcare that people get. We have a lot of people who don't have insurance or who don't have access to high quality providers. And then we also have some bad healthcare outcomes, despite the fact that we have a really developed economy here and we have a healthcare system that can deliver really high quality care. Um, health the life expectancy in the United States even before COVID was falling over the last few years and I just reported this week on one really uh, sad development which is that we're seeing a really large and growing number of Americans who are dying of drug overdoses just one example of a kind of big public health problem that is driving down those numbers. So our four panelists uh, today are terrific. We have Catherine Baker, the Dean of the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy. Martin Gaynor, the E.J. Barone University Professor of Economics and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon. Shelley White Meads, uh, Professor of Health Economics and the Executive Director of the Cheer Health Disparity Center at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center and Zach Cooper, an Associate Professor of Public Health and Economics at Yale. Uh, I'm gonna hand over the screen to them in just a moment, um, and we're gonna start with Kate Baker, and then we'll be back to talk more. Okay, Kate, take it away. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and to solve this really simple problem in the next hour. I'm sure we'll all leave feeling as though it's a job well done. And of course, we're, we're making light of a very serious problem that in the US we spend pushing 20% of our GDP on healthcare, yet we have people who don't have access to critical care and gaping disparities, not just in access to care, but in health outcomes. So I think we, we probably all agree that expanding access to vital services to populations that are woefully underserved right now and to making sure that everyone has access to life-saving treatments is a key goal of health system reform and where we need to go. But I think equally important in making sure that we get to a system with broad access that's financially sustainable is making sure that every dollar we spend on healthcare is going to a good use, is improving health as much as possible. Getting patient incentives right is a crucial step towards that high value, high performance health system that we all need and deserve, but so is getting provider payments right. And I think those may actually be much more powerful levers in lining up the way we pay for healthcare with the high value care that we want the system to deliver. We have a lot more data available now than ever before, and we have much more sophisticated analytical tools. And I think we've just started to scratch the surface of what those tools can do to drive innovative insurance models and innovative payment models that'll make sure that we're getting all the help that we ought to for all of the dollars that we spend and that we can afford to make sure that everyone has access not only to the treatments that exist today, but to what I hope will be a series of innovative, life-saving new treatments for years to come. 
For all of that to happen, though, we have to have a difficult national discussion about what our public insurance plans can afford to cover and should cover. It's really easy to say that we should stop spending money on care that doesn't improve health. You know, everyone is against waste, fraud, and abuse. We're all in favor of cutting spending that is actually harming patients or doing nothing to improve their lives and well being. But there is a lot of care that could be delivered that has really small benefit and enormous price tag. And we have to have tough conversations about which of those services our public insurance plans should cover. That's vitally important for people who are underserved now and for Medicaid populations. It's also a system level import for the Medicare program, where I think because Medicare is such a big payer and is a leader in payment models as well as coverage for a lot of private insurance, if we can get all of that right in Medicare, I think it'll have system level effect. So there are a lot of things that we, a lot of levers that we can pull to try to move towards that system. And I'm hopeful that with some of those new models on board, we'll be able to deliver higher value care to more people. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kate. So I want to invite our next panelist to join us. Um, Marty Gaynor, can you take it away? It's a pleasure to be here with Margo, Kate, Shelley, Zach, and with all of you attending. Thanks for joining us for this very, very important discussion. So look, the healthcare sector is, is huge. It's a fifth of our economy, as Kate says, it's actually bigger than the entire economy of the country of France. And we do some good things, but we're failing to deliver in fundamental ways. Healthcare costs are a burden on individuals and families, a drag on the economy, and significantly contribute to lack of insurance coverage. Average Americans have had any increases in pay they received over the past few, past few decades eaten up by rising health care costs, leaving them no more or maybe even less for basic necessities like housing, food, and clothing, let alone any discretionary spending. The first and foremost contributor to high health care costs is the hospital sector. Hospital sector is about a third of health spending. It's over 5% of the entire economy. It is one of the biggest sectors in the entire economy, bigger than automobiles, bigger than high tech, big tech, bigger than steel, bigger than the brewing industry, bigger than beer, as disappointing a message as that is for many of the college students here. Make no mistake, though, um, the reason that healthcare costs are high is due to high prices. And those high prices come out of workers' wallets dollar for dollar. So addressing high hospital prices is mission number one for getting healthcare costs under control. Lack of competition is a key driver of not only high prices and increased spending, but poor quality, lack of innovation in organization and delivery of care, and abysmal service to patients and their families. This has to be addressed to turn our healthcare system around. There are some relatively simple ways to help healthcare markets work a lot better, but if we don't make those things happen, then we will need to turn to regulation. Direct provision of care, for example, community health centers is often more effective than insurance coverage in getting care to people, especially for underserved populations, and expanding these services is a no-brainer. We should have been doing it yesterday. We need to make major investments in public health, not only to be prepared for the next epidemic, but to make a fundamental basic investment in the health of all Americans. And last, the most disadvantaged, least fortunate among us are those who are hit the hardest by these problems. They're the ones who were devastated by the pandemic. They're the ones who get stuck with paying the high prices hospitals charge to those of us without insurance. They're the ones who lose access to basic care when hospitals merge and close facilities and focus on the most profitable patients. This is bad for these people, these communities, and bad for America. It has to change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marty. All right, uh, let's hear from Shelley White Means next. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to share some insights regarding some things we might need to tweak a bit in our healthcare system. I wanna focus primarily on health inequities uh, and two potential concerns, a zip code influence and a state level influence. The zip code influence is that we have a two tiered healthcare system where the effectiveness of the system of reduction of health outcomes 
is defined by the zip code in which you live. If you live in a segregated multi-generational poverty zip code, traditional healthcare treatments don't generate the same changes in health outcomes as they do for those who live in zip codes without extensive poverty. Holding the chronic disease state and behavioral health state constant, the poverty patient walking into the door of the healthcare system is different from the patient who is not impoverished. When the poverty exposed patient walks in the door, you not only have an embodiment of physical, biological, and psychological concerns, you also have an embodiment of a number of social and economic exposures that we call social determinants of health, including food insecurity, hazardous waste exposures, poor housing quality, high crime, lower quality education, poor transportation systems, limited job opportunities, and limited health insurance coverage as a result. Our traditional treatment alone is not effective because it doesn't treat the whole person. Not recognizing or not incorporating a difference in this patient treatment for the poverty patient leads to more costly care and a revolving door of poverty patients who return in worse states of health than they originally presented because social determinants are not treated. For example, you may have the poverty patient returning to the healthcare system in worse health outcomes because they could not follow the, the uh, dietary plan due to food insecurity, or they couldn't take their medications due to competing financial demands for their limited payroll dollars, or they were homeless and experienced environmental exposures. Our system needs to give a serious examination of fully integrating in a structural manner social determinants of health treatment. A second challenge for us and equity is state controls. 39% of 39 states, including DC, have adopted Medicaid expansion. 12 states have not adopted the expansion of Medicaid to their poverty populations with incomes of 138% of poverty. And this sizable numbers of their residents, about 4 million at last count, lack affordable health care coverage. There are documented financial gains to states when non-participating states change their Medicaid coverage. An estimate of $9.6 billion of federal support net of the cost of uh, expansion are left on the table by the non-expansion states. Yet given this potential gain, non-participating states are satisfied with an uninsurance rate that's almost double that of expansion states. What's also not considered is that the uninsured will eventually present themselves to the healthcare system, helping them to gain early access to care costs less in the long term than not helping the patient at the present. It produces some societal concerns. We have geographic disparities in healthcare coverage for poor patients. The state you live in determines your access to insurance and potentially your access to health care and your health. Because of the racial composition of the non-expansion states, this also means that disparities in health insurance coverage are more likely experienced by communities of color. Within Medicaid expansion states, racial and ethnic disparities in health care coverage have been reduced. Thus, in the United States, states can control whether or not racial ethnic equity and access to health coverage can be achieved for the poor. But at this point, there is no state accountability for the disparate insurance status and health outcomes that result. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. All right, uh, Zach Cooper is gonna make our last presentation and then we're gonna get talking. Awesome, well, thanks, Margo. And, and thanks everyone for, for joining. Thanks for, for having me. Um, and a, a shout out, I have some students who are like in the room over there, so I'm going to give them a plug. Um, you know, I, I think for me, the, the biggest issue in the U.S. healthcare sector right now is really the, the low productivity. And I think it, it dovetails with a lot of the points, Margo, you raised, um, Shelley, you, you brought up, and, and Kate did as well. 
the way I think about it is, you know, we spend a ton, we don't get a, a ton for it. And more than that, the amount we spend on healthcare crowds out spending on other aspects uh, of government spending that could do a lot more good vis-a-vis -vis opportunities, productivity, growth in the economy. You know, I, I think there's one narrative, which is that we spend a lot on healthcare because we don't spend as much on certain social services. You know, for me, I, I actually think in many ways the causality goes, goes the, the other way. The, the reason we aren't spending much or enough on a lot of these social services is because the money is getting misallocated to a, a large and inefficient healthcare system. So the question then is, is what do we do? Um, we actually launched a project in January called the 1% Steps for Health Reform Project that sort of set out um, this path of, of incremental improvements. And you know, the idea is, as Marty said, the US health system, if it was a country, is about the fourth, fifth largest country in the world. There's just not one thing wrong. And there aren't going to be silver bullet interventions. And so we reached out to you know, 20, 30 of the, the best health economists in the country and said, look, can you put forward a single evidence-based intervention, a, a thing where if we flipped a switch, it could lower health spending by a percent or, or two. Um, ended up with 16 proposals that collectively would have lowered health spending if fully implemented by 10%. None of this is, is sort of sexy. All of these are, are sort of at the margin improvements, things like changing the way we pay, pay for, for long-term acute care hospitals or, or ending surprise medical billing. And so the question is sort of why we don't do that. And I think for me, this is where the link between our politics and our healthcare system is so important. Um, the healthcare as an industry spends tremendous amounts lobbying. And so much of what happens in the system is is mediated by government. And some of my work shows, for example, that members of Congress actually see increases in, health, in, in campaign contributions when spending goes up. I think what we need to start thinking about going forward is how we raise productivity and doing so via sort of decoupling our day-to-day -day politics from the, the management of our, our healthcare system. So I guess I'll, I'll toss it back over to you, Margo, and, and yeah, I'm stoked for the, the Q&A and and to hear what my, my fellow panelists are, are going to say. Excellent. All right. Well, so everyone else, uh, please turn your cameras back on because we're all going to be here together for the duration. Um, I, I feel like I just have to ask you guys to talk about COVID a little bit. I feel like we have just been through and are going through this enormous um, you know, kind of historic event that has been a stress on all parts of our society, but of course is also a public health event that's been a stress on our healthcare systems, on our public health systems and lots of other things and, and you know, affected the health of our population in kind of permanent ways. So um, I'm curious what you guys think we have learned from COVID, both about what doesn't work that maybe you didn't notice before, but also what does? I mean, are there things that we have done well or that we figured out how to do well in this crisis that we would be wise to hold on to as we move into the future? And I can jump in with two, yeah. two quick things. Um, of course, we learned a lot about how you address and fail to address a pandemic. But stepping back from that, I think we also learned about the costs of the patchwork nature of our health insurance system where most people who are privately insured get their insurance through their jobs. And we had an economic recession in the middle of a public health crisis when people were at risk of losing their insurance at exactly the moment when healthcare was perhaps most important. And it exacerbated disparities in access to that employer-sponsored health insurance in underlying health conditions and an ability to access care, not just for COVID, but for all sorts of other things where the lack of continuity of coverage means lack of continuity of care for chronic physical health conditions, uh, later diagnosis for things that are better treated when diagnosed early. So I think those fractures became much more salient and the health consequences of that patchwork system became much more salient. One thing that I think we learned in a positive way that I, I hope we'll take forward is to better use the resources that we have 
thinking about telemedicine and how we reimburse for that so that we ease constrained access, not just to people living in rural areas, but to underserved people in urban areas who don't have access to specialists or behavioral health or mental health or primary care. So I think that's one opportunity to expand access and also letting people practice at the top of their license, easing ability to move healthcare providers to hotspots across state lines. Hopefully we'll be able to do more with the resources we have as well as expand resources. Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, so I think a couple things, sort of one thing that's sort of painfully obvious is that we have been under investing in public health in this country for decades now. now uh, that's not just a random thing. Uh, communicable disease uh, has always been here, but has faded relative to its, you know, the importance it once had, say, in the early parts of the 20th century. I'm not minimizing uh, other kinds of uh, previous problems we've had. So we need to reinvest in public health. That's one. Two, the health system has evolved um, to treat acute episodes of illness. It's really not um, evolved. I wouldn't say it was planned, but it hasn't evolved to treat communicable disease. And we saw that. It's very painfully obvious, right? We're very decentralized. We have independent uh, private uh, physicians or for-profit companies, uh, not publicly traded, but for-profit. We have uh, independent private hospitals, so on and so forth. The the government did gear up to do a number of things. There are some real success stories, and particularly pushing um, vaccines across the finish line, that last small bit. That was done very well, and we need to learn from that. But we need to think about um, what we need in a healthcare system going forward where communicable disease is actually a regular occurrence on a, on a significant level as opposed to something that we thought had faded into the background. And that means, in my view, that we need a much larger public role than we've, we've had. I, th I think the one thing that we knew for certain during COVID-19, although we might have, I have had ideas about it prior to COVID-19, was the extent of the health disparities that exist in the United States and the type of risk it poses for uh, experiencing a pandemic. We also learned about the connectedness between poverty and these disparities and how poverty populations were at much higher risk of uh, experiencing COVID-19 and dying from it. Then I was thinking about some of the language we were using during the pandemic and we were calling people essential workers. These were the workers who were out there helping us to make sure that um, our economy was moving forward. But these essential workers are also those low income workers who are at high risk of COVID-19. So it raises a question for me of, do, do we need a system where the coverage we provide for health insurance is uh, meeting is essential for essential workers. If they are indeed keeping our economy going, are we responding in a way so that their essential healthcare needs are met? Yeah, and I, I endorse everything that, that Shelly and Marty and Kate said. I, I think two things to add to it that are, are certainly not superseding because I think the, the big one was the structural inequality. I think what was really interesting for me was in a sense, the inequality of prioritization of providers. Um, so I'm thinking a lot about the COVID relief funding that went out to hospitals. And you know, a lot of physician practices, a lot of hospitals came under immense financial pressure. And what was really, really interesting to me was that there was a decision made to allocate the aid proportional to historical revenues. And so you saw some of the biggest hospital systems in the country who arguably actually were in some of the lowest needs for, for an infusion of cash, get the most money. Um, you know, Margot, I know Reed Abelson, your, your colleague has done some really good reporting about how that money was used. And in many instances, it went to, to do M&A and, and you know, investment and 
in some stuff that I think none of us think is, is probably a particularly fruitful investment. So I think it, it highlighted inequalities both for people, but also in terms of sort of who we prioritize and the sort of political clout of, of different parties. I think going forward, one of the things I'm really curious to see is what happens when there's a sort of 25% drop in, in healthcare consumption. You know, and, and I think in a couple of years, we're gonna hear about what the effect this had uh, on health outcomes. And, and I actually don't know. You know, I think in some ways, I wouldn't be shocked if we found that health outcomes unrelated to COVID and unrelated sort of mental health toll of the pandemic didn't get that much worse because, you know, the hospital system is, is inefficient. Conversely, we might find, you know, the, the certain treatments where, where early care is, is incredibly beneficial got worse. And so I think that's something we have to keep an eye on and, and then hopefully learn from going forward. I feel like a bunch of you guys in your answers to this question in your presentation at well, as well have sort of highlighted how we have a system that's kind of fragmented, uh, that is unequal, where there's people that don't have insurance or they can't quite get to what they need. Um, you know, when you guys think about the structure of our healthcare system, you know, we do have this sort of decentralized system where there's lots of different kinds of insurance. People are getting coverage from their job, uh, maybe from the government, maybe they buy it themselves. All of it is, you know, is often provided by companies that have slightly different strategies. We have, you know, lots of private hospitals, uh, for-profit and non-profit and uh, physicians kind of sprinkled about. Um, is, is the kind of brokenness that comes from the, the fractures between them just intrinsic in having this system that is sort of decentralized and very diverse? Or like, do you need a structural change to deal with those problems? Or is it possible to have a system that integrates across all of those different kinds of insurers and providers better? So definitely maybe, and that's final. <laughs> I, I mean, that, that's a tough question. And in part, Margot, I mean, there's so many different dimensions of, of this. So there are some things we can do that are simple on paper. I'm not saying they're simple to make happen. And the politics, as Zach alluded to, are, are actually pretty tough. But for example, we can take our existing system and do things like the following. We can expand Medicaid further. We could expand uh, eligibility for the Affordable Care Act exchanges. We could get to, if not universal coverage, pretty substantial increases in ways like that without fundamentally changing that system. We can do a whole bunch of things to try and uh, control the cost uh, of care and try and make this market-based system work as well as it can and it will make things better but there are certain things that will not go away now a complete overhaul what does that mean people are talking about single payer so uh, that's certainly something to uh, worthy of consideration but i think a couple things are worth pointing out uh, you move from one system to another, you, you very well may get improvement, but you're not going to be without any problems whatsoever. Single payer systems have their own set set of issues. And um, I think personally, regardless of the merits of, say, a single payer system, which is a very broad term, versus what the status quo, what we have now, but sort of, you know, um, augmenting and uh, and improving the status quo. Uh, I don't think politically that a major change is, is in the offing. So personally, I think it really behooves us to focus on things that are achievable. And as Zach pointed out, uh, small things can add up. Another, and I'll stop talking in a moment, thing that, that a really important insight we get from economics is relatively small changes in a system can roll out eventually as having very big impacts. And so I would not discount that. You know, I think, you know, I wear my reductionist label with, with a bit of pride. So I, I think one of the challenges, and it's sort of a sideways answer to your question, Margo, is I think there's not, there are not particularly strong incentives for firms who are productivity 
enhancing or sort of taking costs out of the system. Like if I were to invent a company that that really did change the way care was treated and, and made it more productive, you know, it's not super clear how I get more money from doing that, at least in the, the short run. So I think until we incentivize firms to, in a world where they, they get more from doing better, it, it's hard to get there. I think relatedly, it's the role of prices. You know, I, I think surprise billing for me was an important example because what it showed was when can we just, I, just briefly explain what surprise billing is? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, you know, this is this idea that you go to an in-network facility, like an in-network hospital, get treated by an out-of-network, you know, in this case, emergency room physician or, or radiologist. And it's these groups of physicians who, who basically face inelastic demand. They, they can't be avoided by patients, so they can have really high rates. The high rates they got, I think, stimulated more investment in those areas. Like, I think when you have sort of slivers of a system, like dark alleys with high rates, that's problematic because it encourages more investment. You know, that's the sort of valiance of the world. That's the sort of, you know, MCARES of the world. Um, please don't send me more nasty emails, MCARE. I, I get enough as it is. But, you know, I think when you have super high prices for doing bad stuff, more firms enter. And so I think a lot of it, and it's related to what Kate said, is how do we, how do we sort of, put sunlight in those dark alleys so that there are not returns from doing the wrong stuff um, and good returns from doing the right stuff. I think that's just very, very hard to do, but that's at a macro level where we need to go. And, and I think I wanna echo a couple of points that have been made and that I think your question astutely pointed us to, which is that the US is an incredibly heterogeneous place. And people often say like, why can't we just be like Sweden? Well, maybe Minnesota can be just like Sweden, but we also have lots of other states that look very different with populations with very different needs, very different healthcare infrastructure, very different economic circumstances, and the one size fits all approach is going to work even less well in the US than it might work in a small, more homogeneous country. So I'm very leery of the idea of just importing another country, a small country system and thinking it's going to work the same way in the US. I'm very much a fan, as Zach pointed out, of the additive incremental approaches. As, as Marty noted, that's both more realistic and probably the most expeditious way to get us towards broader access to higher value care. I do wanna leave on one bigger picture question going back to the, the serious national debate that I think that we need to have. People tend to focus on whether you have access to healthcare or not, whether healthcare is a right or not. Healthcare is not one thing. There is an enormous continuum of things that can be done for any given patient. And thanks to medical innovation, that choice set is growing and growing and growing. And it's not, in my view, sustainable to say, everyone should have every item of care that might possibly be available. That's more than 100% of GDP. That means we have no money for food or housing or education or infrastructure or anything else that's really important. So we have to think hard about whether each item of healthcare is actually worth it relative to the other things we could do with those resources. And the idea that we are aiming for a system where everyone has everything that might possibly be available is counterproductive to getting to a system where everyone has access to high value life-saving care. I think we, we don't position ourselves well to bring up access to people who are radically underserved now by starting with the premise that everyone is going to have exactly the same care and it's going to be all the care that's available in the world. We'll never get there, no one could. So let's focus on writing the biggest problems in our healthcare system in a way that is sustainable. Just briefly, one, I think um, a couple of things that are that are worth pointing out. Well, just one thing, and, and it comes back to Zach's point about the surprise billing phenomenon. We have stuff like this throughout the healthcare sector, and one of the difficulties with fixing healthcare is you got the the balloon problem. You push down on one end of the balloon, and the other end goes up, and who knew healthcare is complicated? And there are lots of participants 
in the healthcare sector that are very aware at any opportunities for profit and will take advantage of it. So that is, that's, I think, a pretty fundamental challenge. And if we, it means that, of course, there's not just one single thing that will fix all of those, but it's something that we, we do have to confront by realizing we're never going to completely eliminate all these things, no matter what kind of system. I wanted to um, circle back to something that um, Kate said about how we sort of, we can't really afford to give everything to everyone because that would uh, constitute our entire economy that in some ways the best healthcare system has gotta be one that is more constrained, um, more equitable, but you know maybe not uh, as, as broad as we might all imagine it. And I guess I'm just, I'm wondering, I feel like it's sort of a truism in a lot of these conversations that the fact that we spend close to 20% of our GDP on healthcare is probably a bad thing and that we wanna limit the amount of our economy that is invested in the healthcare sector in part because it does crowd out um, you know, the sorts of other things that we've talked about earlier in the conversation. But I guess I, I also sort of think, well, like we're relatively prosperous country, like why, you know, health is really important. Like, you know, if we can uh, improve the quality of people's lives and help them live longer, like why shouldn't we uh, be spending a growing share of our large economy on that? And so I guess I'm just wondering, how do we think about the right size for it? You know, like uh, there are going to be new, wonderful health technologies, hopefully in the future that uh, will like really change our lives. You know, if we can uh, eliminate uh, the burdens of disease and disability, uh, isn't that worth money? How, how do we think about that? Well, you know, I, I think just quickly, the, the issue for me isn't spending more, spending less. It's, it's really around productivity. So, you know, juxtapose like something like Harvoni, which costs a ton, but gets rid of, of hep C. Like, I'm totally game for that. Like, sign me up for that drug being funded by Medicare. It works. Um, kidney transplants, right? Each kidney transplant costs a ton, but it saves the Medicare program $150,000 per, per hit. You know, juxtapose that to... You know, I'll just say it, the, the crazy decision to approve, I'm going to like butcher the name, but the, the recent Alzheimer's drug that, that got out there, you know, and this is from somebody who had a father who had Alzheimer's for eight years that sort of tore me and him apart, right? That's a drug that doesn't work, that costs a lot, and, and frankly, probably just worse than doesn't work. You know, what we can't do is have an FDA that says we're going to approve everything that's better than sugar pills, and then set a rate that's whatever the firm wants for that drug. I mean, that's so I think that's what Kate, I don't want to put words in your mouth, I think that's what she's, you know, partly like you could even constrain further, but like we just can't say yes to everything irrespective of, of its efficaciousness. I often wonder, you know, why don't we have an insurance plan that says I'll cover technology approved up to, to 2010? You know, it'll, it'll be a little less. You know, that's in a sense what we do for, for other things. Well, you know, as Zach said, it's not really so much how we spend, it was what we spend it on. And just coming back to sort of relatively um, simple fixes. So here's here's a, a simple fix. At present, a U.S. Medicare program is not permitted to take cost or value for money into account when making coverage decisions. So we get things covered sometimes that are of limited effect, medical effectiveness, but moreover, even more uh, just as problematically, don't generate value for money. So now let's permit Medicare to take that into account. I think that right there is a game changer right away. Things that are really not valuable are less likely to get covered and paid for by Medicare. And moreover, uh, pharmaceutical companies and um, uh, those that develop sort of new procedures have every incentive to keep the prices down because if the price is too high, you're less likely to have Medicare cover whatever it is you're offering. And that leads me to the other thing is high prices. We have, uh, there's a recent study just released by the International Monetary Fund that shows huge markups in the hospital sector in the United States shows that those high markups are driving around 25% of more and the increase in healthcare spending. That's not generating value for patients and for Americans. That's money going from average Americans' pockets into the pockets of, of hospitals. So, and that also applies to, to very high earnings by certain professionals, certain, not all physicians, but physicians in many, many 
specialties and the list of pharmaceutical prices, the list goes on and on. There are ways to address those things if we have the political will to do it. And at last is all of these things hit the hardest for the least fortunate among us. And that just, all of this just increases the problem we already have, exacerbates the problem of health inequities. Another quick thing, um, as we are thinking about uh, investments in health, um, it's also important for us to consider that it's more than just enhancing quality of life. There's a relationship between health and labor force productivity. And so investing in health has um, additional impacts on our economy. And we need to make sure we consider those as well and document them. So I know, uh, oh, sorry, do you want to say one more thing? I'll be super brief just sure. because I love this question so much, which is we don't know what share of GDP we should spend on healthcare. People ask economists that all the time. And we don't live in a planned economy for a good reason. I don't know what share of the economy we should spend on computers or cars. The answer is we should spend as long as we're getting the highest value for that spending that we could for that dollar. And if we were living twice as long and in good health until the day we died, let's spend 50% of GDP on healthcare. The problem is we're spending a lot of money on things that are not producing enough value for what we're spending. So it goes back to Zach's point about productivity. Let's line up the system in terms of how we pay providers, what patients have access to at what price to point towards high value use of every dollar and then let the chips fall where they may. Could be we spend more on some types of healthcare and less on others. Could be we spend more overall or less overall. It won't matter because we're getting the health that we need to out of the system. So Kate, I know you said that we can't just be Sweden, um, but we do have a number of questions from our audience about the rest of the world that, you know, I think the rest of the world has its own problems, but they also have different approaches and in some ways they've solved some of the problems that we have here. So I'm just curious uh, if all of you guys think about how you all think about uh, what countries might be good models, you know, either in part or in whole, are there uh, other people that are doing it better that we can learn from? I think, as Kate said originally, I, I think it is a challenge. Uh, there, there are so many differences between the United States and other countries, even Canada, say, or, or Mexico, which are next door neighbors, that it is a challenge. And so Sweden does things a certain way. There are certain interesting things the Netherlands and Switzerland do, but they are very different countries. There are some things in the National Health Service in the UK that I think are done very well, some some not so well. So I think it's a I think it's a real challenge to look somewhere else and say we should do it this this way. We can learn something though, say if we if we went to something like a, a single payer system, single payer systems, for example, one of the uh, prevalent problems in single payer systems are, are waiting times. And by that, I don't mean sitting in your doctor's office for 45 minutes with only 20 year old copies of Field and Stream to read. We have I mean, that already. Yeah, yeah, we do that already. I mean, waiting at months to even be seen or to be or to be treated. There are some folks who do experience that, of course, in the US, they have no insurance or some Medicaid beneficiaries, but most people most people don't. So that's something to think about. Uh, quality of care is at the high end is another thing to think about. And another thing is innovation. The US is the world leader in medical innovation. Not all of it is really valuable, as, as Zach pointed out. Uh, but how much of that would we sacrifice if we moved to, to a different system? So I, I think these are, these are very tough questions. It's tempting to look elsewhere and say, gee, Sure, can't we just take that off the shelf and plunk that down here and wouldn't it be better? And the answer is it ain't necessarily so. Anyone, ever anyone have a favorite model, favorite country? That I think I would, like I, I really, I don't, I, I never, uh, it's like the modal question I get on, on airplanes. <laughs> I, I'm always like, <laughs> uh, but I, I think there are two 
sort of policy questions that we can ask by looking at, at other countries. You know, the first is related to, to what Marty said, which is, you know, should we introduce some form of cost effectiveness or, or cost benefit analysis explicitly into the Medicare program? I mean, we sort of implicitly do for, for commercial payers. Should we do that? Most other countries do. I think the second one is, should we have market determined prices for providers? You know, particularly hospitals, and and I think we are an international outlier in the sense that we do not regulate those rates. You know, much as it, it sort of makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, I am increasingly of the view that we probably do have to to regulate provider prices, at least in certain markets where competition just just sort of isn't functioning. So I would sort of say, what are the the policy levers that we can learn, as opposed to like you know take take Recovec and and chuck it into to Hyde Park. There are a bunch also of questions from our audience about transparency in healthcare. Uh, you know, why is there no transparency on the price of services, medication, and fees for care? Um, Holly W asks, and a number of other people ask, you know, if we had more transparency, could that uh, solve some of the problems? Uh, there have been some policies that were pursued under the Trump administration, and it seems like the Biden administration is following through to try to make public more of the negotiated prices that um, insurers and hospitals have agreed to for medical care and uh, a bunch of related policies. So I think we're about to get a lot more of that information. Um, how powerful is that? is that? Is that a big lever, do you guys think? No. I know Zach has something to say about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh... It's better than nothing, but no, it's, it's consumerism is not going to radically transform healthcare in part because I rely on my doctor and, and she's the one who sort of tells me where to, to get care. And often she doesn't know what costs I face or, or have the time to differentiate the costs I'd face versus the cost Marty, Kate, or, or Shelly would face. I, I think it is not the same as the market for tomatoes. Um, I think we know pretty clearly that when pricing information is made available, which it actually is for almost everybody with commercial health insurance now, people don't look at it and don't use it. Um, moreover, I think we know from firms, for example, that, that switch their policyholders from full insurance coverage to high deductible plans, it doesn't lead people to, to make more rational consumption decisions. In fact, they stop consuming everything uh, at equal rates, whether they're necessary or unnecessary. Um, moreover, when the people who face high out-of-pocket costs touch the health system, once they're engaged, the cost sharing really doesn't play much of a role. They basically just follow the gravitational pull of what their, their providers recommend. So I'm better than nothing, but I'm not bullish that this is going to you know, transform healthcare. Yeah, I, I, I'm, a, I'm slightly more positive than Zach, but, but still, it, it, for slightly separate reasons, but if you think about the nature of healthcare spending, you'll realize that transparency and um, patients acting to seek out lower prices is not going to really move the, the needle much at all. And here's the reason: what most of healthcare spending is accounted for by people who have very serious illnesses and are getting very expensive treatments. Fortunately, a very small proportion of us. But for those people, one cost is not the thing on their minds. The thing on their minds is getting them or their their loved ones uh, the most effective treatment possible too. Uh, if those people have health insurance, and hopefully they do, I mean, most most Americans do. I'm not minimizing the fact that, uh, that uh, still many of us don't, but most do. Any health insurance plan means when you have an expensive treatment like that, you're past the cost sharing phase. So that means the vast bulk of health spending is not going to be responsive to transparency or price differences. So there's a smaller chunk it can move. As Zach said, the evidence is, is pretty mixed. A lot of it just shows that it doesn't do anything. Some shows something. But we can't pin our hopes on that. I'm fine. Go ahead. Knock yourselves out. Let's see if we can make some difference. Even if it's a small difference, I'll take it. But that's not what's going to drive things. You have to have a third party that is um, an intermediary that's acting in the market, contracting with healthcare providers, uh, hospitals, doctors, et cetera. That's what's going to move these markets. Right now, we rely on third party health insurers to do that. 
We can adopt some policies to try and make those markets as competitive as possible so we can get prices down to a reasonable level. Um, or barring that, we can go to, to price regulation. We can go to price cap regulation, administered prices. As Zach said, pretty much every place else in the world, uh, provider prices are, are set administratively. And that's something that I, I think we have to start seriously thinking about because there are so many holes in the healthcare market's dike that we just don't have enough fingers to put in every single one of them. We've talked a lot about like what the government can do, or you know, I mean, not exclusively, but but a lot we've talked about, you know, what regulators can do and what government programs can do. We have a question from the audience about outside of government intervention and programs. Uh, what can large local health systems or other actors in the healthcare system do to help with uh, delivery disparity? You know, we have these big problems. What can uh, what what are the big levers sort of uh, for the health providers at the local level? Shelly, do you want to do you want to lead this one off? I feel like uh, you've you've done the most work thinking about uh, disparities and, and who's battling them effectively. Well, for this one, this is a difficult question um, because in the local areas we have limited resources, um, especially in states that don't have income taxes, uh, state income taxes. Um, it's, I think it's the smaller level types of interventions that, that are needed at the local level. Um, here, educating people about the importance of good health and uh, embracing preventive health uh, would, would be keys toward um, addressing some concerns and enhancing health. Thank you. So we're uh, actually getting close to the end of our time. Um, I want to thank all of you guys. I want to ask one last question of all of you, uh, which I'm hoping you can answer briefly. But you know, we've sort of talked about brokenness and we've talked about uh, some possible strategies for fixing. But I wonder if each of you could identify one thing that you look for or that you're looking for as a sign of progress. Like, how will we know if we're doing better if the things that we're trying are working? I don't mean it to be a stumper. It can just be one thing. First, you know, the, in the <laughs> end, what we really care about is health outcomes. And it's tempting to focus just on the end product. And in some ways, I don't care how we get there if we have broader access to better health outcomes and we're living longer, healthier lives and that gain is shared around the country. Great. The problem is you can't have a policy that says we shall be healthier. Like the policy levers are all the intermediate steps. So what are, how are we paying people, you know, healthcare providers and hospitals and manufacturers and all of that? How are people accessing care? What are the facilities? Like all those intermediate steps, we're busy trying to pull those levers, but we're not entirely sure how they connect to the end results. And it takes a long time for that to play out. There's some middle outcomes we look at, like we don't want people to die of heart attacks, but we don't want to wait to see who dies of a heart attack. So we look at things like blood pressure management that we're pretty sure affects the heart attack, but that we can measure sooner. So, so it's something the system has really struggled with is what do you measure and therefore incentivize because you can't pay for things that you're not measuring and what's the connection to that whole stream. That gives me some optimism about going back to, to where I started some of my remarks about the usefulness of the modern data revolution, where we have all of these different data sets that link together different inputs and different outcomes from within the healthcare system, but also from outside the healthcare system. And where I think there's gonna be the most traction is if we can design payments that incentivize population health management in ways that we couldn't before and that lead to you know, a disinclination of providers to treat underserved disadvantaged populations because they're so expensive to care for and the resources aren't there that lead to you know, insurance companies trying to disenroll people who are really sick. You know, All of those 
negative consequences could be mitigated by having these data, but could also let us then really reward providers who are managing diabetes for a whole population for whom it's a very high burden. And when the bad thing's not going to happen for years down the road, but we can measure much better how good a job you're doing at mitigating those risks. So that is not at all an answer to your question, but it's where I, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to harness better information about how good a job we're doing, both so we know, but also so that we can pay for better jobs and put resources where they're doing the most good. Zach, what are you looking for? What, what's, what's a measure of success? Sure. I mean, so I, I totally echo what Kate said. I think if I were like picking a couple measures right now, I think one would be some measure of financial toxicity. Like I just think that like lawsuits and debt collection that we're seeing is just not, you can't have folks buying insurance coverage and ending up bankrupt. Um, so I think that's one. I think the second is probably around some acute treatment like heart attacks. Um, and then I think the third for me, I, I'll, I'll make two more. Um, one is I think infant mortality. You know, I think that's just the gains come from kids. There are huge returns to treating them well, so I would do that. I think the one we didn't talk about, and it's not really health system per se, but is, is overdose deaths. You know, I think we saw that today um, with some of the highest numbers of deaths we've seen. That would be on the dashboard if 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 I could create one. Shelly, how are, how are you measuring success? I'm measuring success by looking at this area I focus on, which is health disparities. And I think if we see a reduction in health disparities so that um, there is equity in the healthcare system, that's a key um, measure of success. All right, Marty, how are you measuring success? Uh, this is asking everybody which part of the elephant they're in contact <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, so I think if we see um, substantial um, enhancement of competition in healthcare markets, uh, that to me would be not an end in itself, but a means to an end. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. One thing is remember that the vast majority of the U.S. population has private health insurance. They are not covered by Medicare or Medicaid. And so that means those prices and the incentives are market determined. We have, and for that matter, even folks with Medicare and Medicaid still obtain their care in markets, even though the prices are administered, set by the government. But the quality of care, the accessibility of care, the uh, service, uh, the, the nature of what's provided, the productivity, that's all still driven by markets because we have a market-based system. Now, you may or may not think that is the best possible system, but that's what we have, and we're going to have it for quite some time. We have lots and lots and lots of scientific evidence that shows that when there's more competition, prices are lower, quality is higher, there's better service, there's more innovation. And again, I wanna come back to this because it's important. All of these things have very, very important effects on equity or inequity. The high prices, bad quality, all that stuff hits the least fortunate among us, the most disadvantaged, the hardest. So I think we really have to put pedal to the metal on trying to enhance competition, trying to prevent dominant healthcare providers from exercising market power, from thwarting competition. And if we fail to do that, then our health system just isn't gonna work. Markets are the chassis underneath the car. And if that chassis is broke, the car won't run. We have to fix it. If we can't fix it, then we're gonna to have to turn to something else. Well, I wish that we had more than an hour to talk about this topic. It is a big and expansive topic, but I feel like uh, we, took a lot of good swings at it. And um, it's been such a pleasure to talk with all of you and see all of your faces also. Um, thanks to our audience for great questions. Um, thanks to everyone, all the universities that work together to organize this event. Um, in just a minute, we're gonna all uh, close our screens and you're gonna see a slide with some information about uh, other events in the future. Um, thanks so much and take care guys.